Okay, so hello everyone um, and welcome to the third episode in the uh, Quantum Server Open Webinar Series on Scientific Computing Applications. So today we have the pleasure of having uh, Dr. Uh, ben Horahin as our guest speaker from the University of Strathclyde in the UK and he will be talking to us about uh, the following topic which is uh, um, being slightly wrong for fun and profit, the large-scale semi-empirical modeling of materials. Um, and you can find a bit more information in, in this slide. So in particular, we'll be discussing how the current uh, DFT-based methods can be improved and be more efficient by uh, adopting some approximations such as the density functional based binding method, uh, which can provide a uh, 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 improvement in the speed of uh, a factor of uh, between 100 and 1000 times uh, with uh, almost the same accuracy as DFT, traditional DFT methods. Okay, uh, so with this, uh, I believe uh, we are ready to start this. So, uh, Dr. Huranin, the floor is yours now, and I will just have to make you host in order to allow you to share your own uh, screen and your own uh, uh, presentation. Okay, thank you, Gabriella. Yep. Uh, so I will just make you host. Uh, let's see. Yeah, there it is. Okay, so you are ready to present now, uh, Mr. Horani. Okay, thanks. Right. Okay, so let's see if I can actually get this to uh, successfully share the right screen, which is always what goes wrong with Zoom when uh, people are using this on multi monitors. But uh, right, okay, please tell me if you cannot see the, uh, the slide uh, coming up here. Okay, I'm not hearing a response, so I assume the slides are okay. Uh, right, so I'm gonna be talking about um, methods that take um, an approximate uh, view on solving uh, electronic structure for applications, well, in my case, particularly material science, but with applicability to chemistry, condensed matter, uh, biochemistry, and several other areas. Um, so I'm based um, up in Scotland at the University of Strathclyde, uh, which is one of the four universities within the general area of Glasgow. Why is this accelerating off into the middle distance? Um, but I'll carry on with the slide. Um, so in terms of semi-empirical methods, well, empirical is something which is derived from experience. And these tend to be methods which are past and um, they tend to be pretty straightforward to understand. Um, in terms of uh, applications within materials chemistry context, usually the idea would be to be quantum mechanical, but um, there's perhaps a, a, a separate discussion to be had over um, the, uh, the role of classical models in this kind of area. And there are certainly a number of groups who can, can talk about empirical classical models uh, as well. Now, one of the payoffs from this is that these types of things tend to be fairly extendable. Um, and if you have a semi-empirical method, quite often uh, you can find ways of converting first principles or ab initio um, methodologies into techniques that will actually um, allow you to examine length or time scales that are otherwise inaccessible um, with a slight, well, potential advantage that you can always renormalize the model to incorporate things that are missing. So you can be a little bit phenomenological about what you're doing. Now the kind of um, plots that people tend to draw a lot of in um, the sort of material science world look something like this kind of um, set. The boxes change a little bit from field to field and the focus of interest floats around a bit. But broadly, um, we're looking at a spectrum of methods that range from techniques which can cope with um, very high accuracy simulations of, of systems, but are restricted to scales which are um, perhaps sub nanometer. And this is where high level ab initio methods live, where um, a lot of techniques from quantum chemistry are found. Um, climbing up the scale a little bit larger, um, you tend to find semi empirical methods. And this is the, the sort of regime that I'm going to be talking about. So there's a corresponding, not just length, but also time scale increases you climb up this, this hierarchy. So ab initio methods, um, you can simulate perhaps with, with substantial resources, kind of picoseconds, 
if you dial up to the semi-empirical level, you can start to look at systems over the perhaps nanoseconds to hundreds of nanoseconds, depending on what you're doing. And then beyond that is the regime of methods like classical force fields, phase field methods, and similar techniques. Uh, and then eventually scaling on via things like finite element, you get to continuum theories. Um, so things like thermodynamic predictions and other large scale, uh, which are now in, well and truly into the macro scale and very long time scales. Okay, so in terms of sort of system sizes, that's the broad issue. Um, and what's underpinning a lot of this is the computational costs for scaling different types of model up with system size. So the, uh, depending on the community you come from, you live with different types of, of scaling behaviors. So quite often um, in the, the larger scales, people are dealing with things like classical elasticity, which is effectively size independent. So you can deal with fast systems and make predictions. Um, obviously, this is a method that is fitted from a whole hierarchy of things below it. And so you have to stay within the regime where it's applicable. Going to a more atomistic model, the typical costs for these kinds of techniques, and this is things like interatomic potentials, scale with, with the, the system size in a linear manner. So double the system size, double the cost. Quite typically for quantum mechanical methods, once you start to get into things like density function theory, and also type binding, which I'll come back to, um, the naive way of doing these things scales quadratically with the system. So cubically with the system size. So if you double the system size, you have eight times the weight until you get the solution. Um, and typically your memory cost scope is the square of the system size as well. Um, there are of course, some situations where you can drop that, uh, that scaling behavior. And there is an entire community around what are called linear scaling methods in these family of techniques um, where you can drop things down to uh, a linear with system size cost, usually at the expense of a much larger prefactor. So the intercept on the axis for the, gra the graph moves upwards, but also quite often many of these techniques are not universally applicable to general systems. They have some requirements on perhaps short sightedness of the electronic states, which in many cases translates into, for example, insulating behavior. Or, just, or strongly disordered behavior. Okay, scaling up from that, you start to get the domain of more core quantum chemistry methods. So again, there are ways to drop some of these um, scaling behaviors, but naive Hartree-Fock scales as the fourth power of the system size and post Hartree-Fock correlated methods go even higher. Um, right, so the regime of things like configuration interaction, when you really have genuinely seriously many body systems obviously computation is extremely expensive. And this is, is kind of the converse of the system scales. Okay, so in terms of general performance, um, the kinds of costs that we're looking at, and this is some uh, results from a review article going back now 20 years um, for calculating, for example, a vacant site in a crystal silicon where you just take a repeating periodic model and pluck out one atom, you can see that the kinds of formation energies for a range of different methods um, are all looking relatively similar. Um, so as a, someone from a solid state physics background, I'm fairly happy with electron volts as a unit. Um, if you are sort of more familiar with um, kind of chemistry um, choices, probably you're going to be thinking in terms of kilocalories. Um, but um, one um, uh, um, milli electron volt is not too far away from four kilocalories per mole. So you can kind of interconvert for these things. So on the scale of these kinds of things, we have an error bar between the different methods on the order of about 0.5 electron volts, um, which you know, shows you have a spread of these things. Um, but I'm focusing on the time for a few seconds here. So if we look at the bottom of the, the, the list, full self-consistent uh, LDA density functional theory, that's around about an order of magnitude higher in direct cost than things like orthogonal type binding at the other end of the list. And within this set, um, methods like um, type binding um, kind of fall into uh, the middle regime in this. And um, so you can see the self-consistent versions of these kinds of type binding models are round about an order of magnitude faster than the full density functional case. For this particular example of this particular size system. The scaling behaviors, as I was saying, for these kinds of things tend to be roughly on the same trajectory though. 
Um, so that's the, the, the kind of landscape to, to look at these kinds of things. Now, I was mentioning that um, type binding kind of methods and the uh, variety that I was talking a bit about um, during the um, seminar, DFTB specifically, um, you're looking at something which is uh, around about um, between two and 20 on that particular scaled set of time units. So if we've got this advantage, how far can you actually push this? Well, the, um, the largest kinds of um, simulations that um, are in the literature, and I think the, the group uh, here in uh, Waseda University in Japan will be superseding this rapidly because the next generation Super K supercomputer is now available, of course. Um, they can quite happily push things up to the order of perhaps two or 300,000 atoms. I've seen them present on up to about a million for these kinds of systems, which consist of large boxes of liquid water. And this is one of these situations where there are some special um, things at play that allow such a large simulation, because in the case of liquid water, the quantum mechanics for this is relatively localized. Um, there's not much um, overspill in terms of quantum mechanical behavior from water molecule to water molecule. Um, but there are techniques that deal with these, these kinds of things and scale very well. If you look at something which is a bit more uh, non-local and delocalized, um, these are somewhat old results um, that uh, I did about five years ago. If we have a look at, for example, a graphene system in a strong magnetic field. Now, this is one of these cases where you want to go to large system sizes because there's a, uh, a major problem because if you look at the, the physics of uh, Lando levels, the size of the simulation limits the strength of the magnetic field. And the magnetic um, length, which is the characteristic scale for these kinds of things, scales inversely with the strength of the field. So if you want to drop down to experimentally accessible fields, you need to have simulations, even in two dimensional materials that are well over 20,000 atoms or so. So this was a um, simulation for about 12 hours on a few thousand processors on the supermarket system um, using somewhat elderly solvers. Um, we can do a bit better these days. Um, but you can see that, for example, the Landau levels are spreading out as you turn the field strengths down. The point about Landau levels is they are highly degenerate. So they are spread out over the whole system. So that means a lot of the conventional tricks for large system scaling don't actually apply here because you've got a delocalized quantum mechanical system. Um, okay, right. So I said I would actually say a bit more about what type binding actually is. Um, it comes in a variety of different uh, forms, but uh, the name itself comes from the fact that you are using uh, a set of functions associated with atoms to expand out the solutions to your problem. So the, the name comes from the fact that these are tightly bound to the atoms. Now the result of electronic states, as with the graphene example a few seconds ago, um, are not necessarily localized. So the solutions to the problem can be extremely spread out. And it will depend on the nature of the physical system you're simulating as to how that behaves. This is a consequence of things like the band gap, or for example, to pick a, a currently hot topic, if there is a topological component to what's going on in the system. Um, now, quite typically, the equations you write down in type binding are often simplified or approximated in some way to make the calculations easier. And the extreme end of this is typically what people think of when they say type binding. Anybody from a chemistry perspective may recognize uh, some of this language in terms of what's called extended Huckel theory. And the idea is to fit um, the components of your model against data from other sources. And that may be from high level uh, quantum chemistry or density functional calculations, or it may be directly from experiment. And that's typically what most people think when you say type binding to them. Actually, um, there are essentially three different categories of type binding. So I was talking about the empirical ones. Um, and usually you have an exercise in fitting quite large numbers of parameters. Um, the variety that I use sits in the middle of this, the semi-empirical ones, where you try and evaluate parameters on the whole from first principles. But you perhaps fit some components which are difficult to deal with uh, efficiently by taking data from some other theory. Uh, and then you have what's called ab initio type binding methods, which is essentially going back to the, the concept of the localized basis, but using this to solve uh, perhaps the full density functional equations or other types of Hamiltonian. And there's no free parameters in these kinds of methods. So 
for example, the uh, linear muffin tin orbital technique in solid state physics would just about fall into this taxonomy and a minimal basis in something like uh, a Gaussian calculation is sort of close to this. Okay, right. So, um, prehistory on the specific um, type of um, technology that uh, I'm using, which is the FTV. Um, and so, as I mentioned, linear combination of atomic orbitals to construct things that look like wave functions from atomic states. And, you know, this idea goes back to the 1920s and is essentially sort of resting on the fact that um, the Schrodinger equation is linear, so combinations of solutions are going to be a reasonable idea for a solution themselves. Um, so, dialing forward from uh, the 1920s, um, one of the seminal papers in this kind of area of um, semi-empirical and empirical type binding methods is what are called the Slater and Costa transformations, which were published in the 1950s. And this gives um, a way to efficiently and compactly write down relatively complicated Hamiltonians in particular two center uh, formulation, suppressing terms which depend on three center and four center. Um, as it turns out, there are some uh, advantages to doing that. Then into the 1960s, you get um, the formalization of the original ideas of Thomas and Fermi in terms of the idea that instead of dealing with wave functions, you can use the electron density or more generally, because you can do, apply this for multi-component systems, for example, and even classical systems, the density of the system is actually a fundamental variable. And formally as Walter Cohn and co-workers showed, single particle equations can exactly solve the many particle problem um, with a slight problem, which of course, after approaching 60 years, we still don't have an answer for, um, one of the terms in his particular family of equations is only known to be exact if you actually have a way of calculating it. We don't have an exact way of calculating it. So there is five decades worth of approximation working towards high accuracy solutions for that term. Okay, if we uh, look at uh, type binding, um, the slight issue is if you want to do something like quantum chemistry or if you want to compare relative energetics for, for different geometries, you want a total energy. And that was solved for the empirical type binding world back in the 1970s by Jim Chaddy by writing down a total energy expression for these kinds of things. Um, so obviously this is kind of towards the, the point where university research solving electronic structure took off, but um, machines of the day seriously limited the kinds of problems you could solve. And so one of the more successful attempts at um, getting access to large systems um, dates back to the early 1980s. And so this was a collaboration primarily between Gotthard Seifert, um, the, the former chair of chemistry at Dresden University, and Helmut Eschrig, one of the chairs of theoretical physics there. Um, so one of the, the, the more in-depth books about density functional theory, uh, Eschrig published uh, around about 20 years ago. Um, and what they were proposing was a way to cut down the, um, the costs of full-on density functional theory by calculating um, with basically some approximations uh, the results of density functional theory and storing them for later use. So reusing um, calculations of things like integrals and applying these things to um, solve larger systems than were accessible with the full density functional equations. So the, the kind of major features of this are uh, atomic uh, based uh, orbitals. Um, and I'll show you something in a second to, to uh, kind of demonstrate what I'm talking about here, which are trapped inside of a confining potential. And you get various terms in the model from atoms. Um, so you have to, for example, account the limit where these things separate apart if you dissociate a molecule. Um, but when they are closer together and interacting, the calculations are done in a two center approximation. And it turns out that there's some error cancellation between crystal field and three center terms, which actually makes this quite a good approximation because there are some things about core states um, that this um, deals with in a way that actually ups the accuracy of the resulting calculation. And then you get a total energy from the resulting band structure and an idea similar to the, the solution from Chaddy from the 1970s of adding 
repulsive term for this. So the main idea for the Hamiltonian is to say, what we're gonna do is take a bunch of neutral atoms in confining potentials. So the, the, uh, the little sort of ball city inside of the middle of the potential here is your atom in usually quadratic potential. The reason that that's added is to try and push the thing into finding solutions that are relevant to a condensed phase. That seems like quite a crude approximation, but it actually works remarkably well. And once you've got uh, solutions for atoms there, you can then start to expand out the density of your more complicated system um, in those confined atomic densities. So you get an expression for the, the total energy, which depends on um, functionals of the reference density that you're building up for these neutral atoms, where you have a band structure part and a repulsive part, and the series carries on out. And so you can calculate things that depend on um, the reference things explicitly and do this exactly within the con uh, constraints that you are dealing with a reference density which is built up of neutral atomic um, systems. Um, so there aren't uh, any adjustable parameters in the electronic structure part of the calculation, but um, there are approximations. Now the, uh, the other term, which is where you hide all the physics, which is um, somewhat um, dented by this approximation for the electronic structure is this repulsive term on the end. And this is um, the part that you actually have to build uh, repulsive parameters for. So the idea is to tabulate the difference between results from a high level theory. So typically density functional theory. And these days this would quite often be things like hybrid functional. Uh, so something like B3LIP or a post B3LIP method and the electronic structure energies you just get from the band structure and where you truncate off your expansion series. That means that if you want to fit these kinds of things, you have to consider all of the types of interactions between atoms. Now, fortunately, it turns out that this additional contribution is quite short range and it's quite well represented by pairwise repulsive potentials. So for example, taking a carbon hydrogen system, if you were interested in modeling, say hydrocarbons or hydrogen on top of a diamond surface or something like this, you need pairwise repulsive interactions between carbon and carbon, carbon and hydrogen, and hydrogen and hydrogen in order to get a total energy calculation for this. And so you have to sit down and figure out a way to fit these kinds of things. Typically, people who build parameter sets um, seriously for this, this is where most of the effort goes into in terms of selecting the relevant systems and also making sure that you get a good quality fit that's not only accurate, but transferable to other systems. Um, okay, and that's quite a challenge. So for example, working with stretching and compressing pairs of atoms and diamonds is usually not enough to get that right. Um, you have to choose a wide uh, spectrum of systems and typically look at a range of properties. And there's a whole uh, literature around here developing parameterizations for different systems. DFTB is particularly known for um, organic systems, but has been fitted for a variety of other cases as well. Okay, right. Um, so you have to co-optimize things too. And it's kind of a hint for where things are actually going at the moment, which is these kinds of problems look a lot like the sort of thing machine learning does quite a good job on. I'll say a few words about, about that a little later. Okay, right. So, okay. So the original theory for this is non-self-consistent. You just take neutral atomic fragments, you build the quantum mechanics up and assemble these kinds of things. If you want to go beyond that, you carry on down and look at the second order fluctuations in the system. It turns out by symmetry, the first order ones don't actually matter in the energy expressions or the Hamiltonian. Um, but what you can do is expand out your energy functional to the second order in this. And the, the, several different groups around about the same time using different forms of this kind of semi-empirical method, all had broadly the same kind of idea. Within the context of DFTB, the, the sort of seminal paper from that is from the late 1990s. Um, and um, the idea is that you have a look at the variation of the charge from neutrality, broken down into atomic Mulliken charges on top of sites, and you do some adjustment for this with a uh, stand-in for both the Coulomb and some of the exchange correlation. The kind of functional for this thing um, has a general shape where 
there are some exact limited cases which are known, which is the on-site energy, which is to do with the chemical hardness, and the long range where these things die off. If you dig into the details a little bit, um, you have to be a little bit careful about the functional form. The original one actually adds exchange correlation terms where there shouldn't be any, but this has subsequently been fixed in later work in the, the mid uh, 2000s. It's got a nice review of this from about six years ago that talks about some of the history there. And Marcus Elsner, who was name checked there, has pushed a lot of that development. Okay, right. Um, so the resulting model is sometimes referred to as DFT light because you can also view this as descended from the non-self-consistent Harris density functional. Um, and you get a non-orthogonal type binding model, which is pretty transferable. Um, it's accurate up to the second order in uh, fluctuations in charge and also spin, which I've not mentioned, um, and a more recent extension to the third order as well. And it, the results of this thing look a bit like LDA, GGA kinds of data. And there's quite a few papers that go through large databases, and I'll show you some of the numbers, and just look at the mean square deviations from these kinds of things. The method's parameterized, but once you get the parameters, there is no integration or refitting after that, the thing kind of runs. And around about 2000 SP bonded atoms is something you can do quite easily on a, on a modern desktop machine. Now, since this thing comes from DFT, a bunch of DFT properties also naturally drop out of this kind of thing. Um, and because it's semi-empirical, there's also a relatively simple picture of what's going on in the system. So simple ideas like Mulliken populations actually mean something to this theory, uh, which is kind of nice. Okay, right. So compared to DFT, well, DFTB is fast. Um, the numbers I was showing, the, the, the best value there was about two orders of magnitude. It turns out for small systems on high throughput, the prefactors on DFT versus DFTB matter, and you can maybe get three orders of magnitude. So there are a bunch of examples um, in the literature where you would perhaps be a thousand times faster for those cases. But if you go to larger systems, uh, perhaps one to two orders of magnitude is more like the, the kinds of costs you're looking at. Asymptotically, if you go to very, very big systems, most DFT is linear scaling. So eventually um, that, that advantage will disappear. But I've not seen a calculation big enough in DFT where you can't tell the difference in these kinds of times yet. Okay, so you get a sensible answer from a mineral basis calculation, and the thing um, clearly breaks its, pro its calculation down into different types of interactions. So, for example, you can talk about the energy of atoms within a molecule or a larger structure. Um, I've seen this be used for some advantage to, for example, look at energies around dislocations in crystals, because you can resolve the local strain and local energies onto the individual atoms in the dislocation core region and talk about this. And you can get accuracy close to DFT level if you're careful about it. Now, computationally, the worst scaling part of this thing is exactly like traditional DFT. Um, there are some improvements in terms of numerical stability that the condition numbers for the matrices and so on are a bit better. So there are some solvers which can, can make a little bit out of that. The bigger headache is the parameterization cost scale is the square of the number of chemical species. So there's quite a few people whose PhD basically consisted of getting a good parameterization working and then doing the science they wanted in the end of the PhD. Because it can take quite a lot of time, especially if you've got multiple components in your system to set these things up properly. And there isn't really a systematic way to improve beyond the minimal basis in the classical version of this theory. Now it turns out both of these last two points are in the process of being addressed by, well, last time I counted, I got uh, slightly over 12 groups using different forms of machine learning approaches. Um, whether, they, whether they are going to attack the uh, repulsive potential part or work out ways to, to learn the Hamiltonian um, or some combination of both are still ongoing. And this might be a nice talk for this series uh, from someone from that community in, in, in a future uh, seminar. Because there's all sorts of interesting things going on there. The state of the art on these things is you can get to results that match, say, GGA DFT to something like 10 times better than chemical accuracy across broad systems. And you're doing that on the basis of the computer working out how to parameterize the thing. So that, that area is, is definitely developing rapidly. Um, okay, right. Compared to empirical type binding, one of the big differences is that we actually have a genuine basis set. So you can do things like plot orbitals and you can have a look at um, states and these things, but also 
ideas from DFT map onto this quite happily. So a lot of ideas around excited states, optical spectra, self-consistent quantum transport and so on are fairly straightforward to do in this kind of, kind of framework. Okay, right. So I mentioned about accuracy. Well, this is all star classical um, technology for fitting these things by hand. And this is several years of se several people's life to get a bunch of uh, parameter sets, which you can then turn loose on, for example, the G2 set of um, molecular re reactions. And right, uh, and as you can see, you typically get um, a mean average deviation on the order of a few kilocalories per mole. So this is on the order of um, a few milli electron volts discrepancy for these kinds of things. I mentioned um, DFTV3. That actually gives you a slight improvement. The, the paper here was primarily focused on um, um, bio, bio inorganic systems, particularly manganese, uh, so magnesium and zinc containing um, systems. Um, and again, you can get a distinct improvement in the uh, fitting for these kinds of things. So that particular paper was developed in what's called the 3OB set. Um, and again, you can get reasonably good mean average deviations to these slightly more challenging organometallic systems. Okay, I mentioned about spin. Well, the original ideas about spin go back um, to the early 2000s. And this is a global optimization study of iron nanoclusters from the time. Um, and it all works relatively well. You can expand the functionals out to allow for spin fluctuations. And again, the errors for, for this, and this is some work from uh, Thomas Heiner's group. I, I think Thomas is now um, actually the, the chair in Dresden. So the position Seifert was originally and you can see that you get, um, again, quite accurate um, cases for spin polarized um, systems as well. Okay, right. You can do excited state calculations too. Um, so um, ground state is pretty routine in, in DFT these days, but excited state is a little bit less common, both with DFT and also DFTB. And there have been various ways that have been demonstrated how to do this for DFTB, mostly based on ideas from density functional theory. So pretty much if it's been tried with DFT, then somebody out there will have published a DFTB version of these kinds of theories. There's a whole bunch of different things ranging between conventional time dependent density functional methods through to more many body driven techniques inside of this. And this kind of technology has been around for a long time. So for example, excited state calculations for um, the C60 molecule were published 20 years ago uh, by um, Thomas Niehaus and his group. Um, and these kinds of things work quite nicely and predict the properties pretty well. Okay, so where do you get your hands on DFTB? Um, the main portal for the entire community, DFTB.org, has got a, I think it's probably a partial list if I'm gonna be honest about it, of implementations for codes that have got this kind of technology built in. So um, have a look around, follow some of the links. Um, and um, within that zoo, the one that I work with particularly um, is something called DFTB Plus. So um, we had a, uh, a recent release um, a couple of weeks back and we had a, another method paper out as well. I'll mention a little bit about that in a minute. So, okay, ancient history, this goes back to a Marie Curie network um, to look at trying to use the DFTB method with lanthanide chemistry. So a bunch of things like correlated systems, spin orbit coupling, challenges about parameterization and so on. Um, and um, we published a couple of years after that, um, the original ref reference paper for the, um, the method, uh, sorry, the implementation of the method. Um, it's my co-author Valent on the end there. Um, and we kind of carried on going since that time. So in terms of applications, you can deal with things like LDA plus U-like corrections. So this is um, some recent work from Seifert looking at complex oxide applications where you can get analogous magnetic orderings and relatively good descriptions of things. You can see some of the limitations of the minimal basis here. If you look in detail at the density of states for states uh, here compared to the larger basis that you get with things like PBE plus U and hybrid functionals, um, the actual uh, band structure for this thing is a bit uh, sparser. So the density of states is, is not showing quite as much feature, but in terms of energetics, you can get a, a reasonable prediction of things like the, um, the geometric structure. Have a look at their paper if you want details on this. Um, now the original say, uh, intention for the DFTB plus code was lanthanide systems and 
For example, you can have a look at defects and impurities inside of uh, the gallium nitride semiconductor system, which have got correlated electrons using these kinds of things. So this is um, Simona Sanna and, uh, and his work um, looking at relative energetics of doping these things as a function of the um, level of uh, electron doping in the material, whether you have B-type or N-type semiconducting behavior and relative stabilities of these things. Now, the original paper 2007 we get, is getting a bit long in the tooth, so we have um, recently done an update on this earlier this year, which is the, the, the link that Gabriella included in the description for the seminar. So the author list on this one's a bit bigger, um, and we've got people from um, five continents contributing to the code these days. Um, so in terms of the kinds of things that are in the most recent code, uh, well, high performance parallel solvers, some of which are linear scaling or low prefactor are, are present. Calculations for more unusual geometries. So we've had periodic and molecular boundary conditions for years. Uh, we can now do cases like the geometry of something like DNA where there is a helical twist. Because in a bunch of those, those structures, the actual supercell is going to be far too large to be actually simulated in conventional ways. But if you get the helical unit, something called objective geometries, you can, you can approach this quite straightforwardly. There's a metadynamics of there, particle-particle RPA for excitations, uh, dispersion interactions, and, and we've got the most uh, recent development from Stefan Grimmer's group, um, solvent models, which is also implemented by one of the PhD students in, in Stefan's group. Um, so this is uh, Sebastian Erhard. Um, and acceleration GPUs, real-time electron dynamics. So we can actually look at how things evolve inside, inside the system when you kick the, the, um, the system uh, with some sort of external perturbation. And you can actually follow the electron dynamics through that. Um, things like spin-restricted uh, ensemble cone charm. We have got technology for Green's function transport. So you can actually wire up uh, a molecule or a solid to some electrodes and put the thing under bias and have a look what happens. Um, and recently we've also acquired things like bindings for Python and C++ um, and other external codes inside of there. Okay, so in terms of the code availability, we're now on Anaconda again. Um, Sebastian uh, put sterling work into getting this loaded up there, but we're also present within the electronic structure bundle from CCAM. So they're definitely worth checking out. It's um, a um, initiative to try and build up a set of tools which are modular and can be uh, used to avoid reinventing uh, things when people are using new sorts of developments in, in codes. So very interesting project. Okay, uh, in terms of quantum mechanics and molecular mechanics coupling, which is one of the, the, the sort of bigger uh, areas of application with this sort of theory, uh, we've got integrations within a few of the um, the more common um, intratomic potential codes. Um, and um, so they're definitely worth checking out if you do that kind of thing, where you have perhaps a transition metal in some active site in an enzyme, where you know the thing has to be treated quantum mechanically, perhaps because of spin or bond making and breaking, but you don't really want to spend the cost of, of looking at the surrounding protein. Okay, I mentioned about things like particle-particle RPA. Um, well, we've got various hybrid functionals and um, uh, also the many body stuff, and it does pretty well for the right kinds of problems. So these are absorption spectra of a range of different systems. Have a look at the papers again if you want to know the details, but we get very close results against things like coupled cluster um, under the right circumstances. Okay, real-time propagation I mentioned. Uh, one of the fun things you can kind of do with this is um, you can kick the system and watch what happens when things evolve. So you can hit, say, a molecule with a pulse, and have a look at how uh, the atoms in the thing are going to result, uh, respond and, and show dynamics for this. And um, we can cover some cases for periodic systems, but a lot of the applications so far have been for molecular cases. I mentioned transport. Um, so non-equilibrium Green's function technology um, is a little bit more unusual in terms of uh, codes. Um, but um, what you can do is, and this is, for example, graphene ribbon with a a defect in there, there's a missing carbon atom in the center here, is you can set the system up and solve self-consistently under um, conditions where the, the system doesn't terminate, but continues on to semi-infinite leads and contacts. And depending on how you want to do this, for example, you get transmission probabilities for electrons, make it from one side of the system through to the other one, 
or you can set to a, um, a new release um, this year, um, which is associated with um, a new methods paper describing the state of the code. Um, and in terms of um, technologies that are in there, um, so large scale uh, high performance parallel computing uh, solvers for the, the electron structure problem. A lot of this is driven by a project in the US, which is the, um, the ELSI project, and they maintain a, uh, um, a repository for this thing. Um, the, uh, the idea there is they're trying to package up a set of high performance parallel solvers for use in the general community of electronic structure. Um, and the, um, the technology there includes um, some best in class electronic structure solvers uh, for various types of Hamiltonian. Uh, some of these things are very general purpose, but have very good parallel scaling. Others have got low uh, scaling, so large system sizes become accessible. Um, and so uh, it's, a, it's a very worthwhile project. Okay, we also have some technology for looking at geometries which are not conventional periodic um, or molecular cluster. So we can do, for example, helical geometries where the unit self of this thing is not translationally repeating. Um, so think, for example, the geometry of DNA. Um, if the twist angle of that is an irrational um, value, then the conventional supercell for this is going to be in principle infinitely large. But if you can abstract out the fundamental unit that actually translates and rotates, you can make much smaller calculations for these kinds of things. Um, so this is one of a family of different geometries that pop up in material science. Um, so these things which are usually referred to as objective geometries cover all sorts of unusual geometry cases which are difficult to examine with other techniques. Um, so we've got molecular dynamics because going back to um, one of the earlier slides, uh, one of the applications for this is it's fast so you want to be able to move atoms around um, and we've recently got an interface to the, the standard meta dynamics tools in the plumed packages. Um, which works quite nicely for things like enhanced energy landscape sampling um, and al allows you to um, explore the free energy landscape much more efficiently than conventional MD. Um, in terms of um, interactions for molecular systems that are um, perhaps going to benefit from this, we've also got uh, the next generation of dispersion models from Stefan Grimmer's group. Um, so things like the DFT D4 model, um, which um, is um, a very um, high performance way to describe weak, weak interactions in systems. Uh, one of the, the students in the group, um, so Sebastian Erhardt, also contributed some code for implicit solvent models. Um, so something we've been missing for, for a while, uh, but we now have this. Um, we can also do things like real-time electron dynamics. So this is one way to get access to excited state properties because if you have the dynamics in time, the Fourier transform of that tells you about the energy of the excitations in the system. Um, but you can also use this as literally a real-time evolution of the electronic um, states of the system um, and have a look at what's going on. Uh, for example, when you perturb a system and you watch charge flow around inside of it. Um, now, Ehrenfest dynamics technically are a mean field approximation of what's really happening, but it's quite a powerful way to, to look at systems. Um, okay, we also have, and again, um, this is um, a way to get in, in, into, for example, some information about excited state is uh, what are called spin restricted ensemble cone charm methods. So, this is, for example, um, the, uh, the group in, in South Korea and Busan have contributed this, um, and it gives um, a way to have a look at states which are actually more like the kinds of wave functions that really are present instead of the approximate cone charm like states. So you build an ensemble of these things and solve for these kinds of, kinds of cases. And they've also got um, hybrid functionals as part of that calculation methodology. We have hybrids uh, already for more conventional DFTB. So this is, for example, the Niehaus group have, con have done a lot of work in this area. Um, and we're bringing in the ra uh, range separated excited calculations for uh, things via procedure like formulations as well. That's quite an important uh, contribution because one of the famous pathologies for conventional excited state calculations in DFTB 
uh, which it inherits from DFT, is that in the absence of uh, the kinds of long range correlations that you get in um, exact exchange, um, the energies for things like charge transfer excitations are much, much too low. And, and the reasons for this are all, all known, it's a self interaction problem. But unless you do something about it, it means that you get spurious um, low energy absorption features, for example. I mentioned about unusual boundary conditions. We also have mechanics of um, Green's function embedding and Green's function open boundary transport, primarily uh, developed from the, the group in, in, uh, um, in Tor Vergata in, in Rome. Um, and recently we've added in things like correlation models from LDA plus U-like directions, but also things like semi-infinite surfaces are possible. So you can now do a calculation where you just look at an isolated surface on a semi-infinite bulk. Um, so that's, that's kind of useful if you do surface science, but also things like the ends of uh, say carbon nanotubes or wires, where you don't want to worry about the rest of the, um, the structure. So you can just look at the, the end of it and be confident that it's consistent with an infinite structure continuing on. We also have technology um, for driving the code externally from either Python or other languages. So both Fortran and, and C family languages um, can, can talk to the API we've got. And that recently become, became MPI enabled, which was intended for um, quantum uh, mechanical region coupled to molecular mechanics codes. Um, so I'll say something about that in a, in a second. We're also, and again, Sebastian did sterling work on this, uh, available under Anaconda. So you can just do a Conda install and pull down either the, the main binary code or the Python bindings as well. Um, we're also included within the electronic structure library bundle, which is a, a CCAM project, which is intended to collect up uh, a, a whole bunch of different uh, pieces of software and bring together some sort of uh, combined project that allows people to avoid reinventing things. So you can use components of this, for example, to assemble um, a DFT code or to do other types of, of calculation. And the ESL uh, project have just recently had a, a paper out describing their, their activities and it's worth a look at. It's a very interesting um, uh, development and uh, it's hopefully gonna continue. Um, okay, I mentioned about quantum mechanical molecular mechanics um, calculations. Um, the DFTV plus code is integrated into several of the molecular mechanics codes that are out there. Um, so if you have a problem where, for example, you have a region that you expect there to be um, bond making and breaking or complicated transition metal chemistry, um, so you know, some enzyme site that, that's got a transition metal in the middle of it or something like this, um, and you want to model it, well, you could do a quantum mechanical model of the entire system, but it's probably much more efficient to let the interatomic potential ideas in molecular mechanics deal with most of the structural motifs of the surrounding material and just have a small region which is dealt with quantum mechanically. Um, and so um, that kind of QM, MM coupling becomes possible with those kinds of codes. Um, they also allow people who are more familiar with that particular uh, molecular mechanics code to get access to the results of DFTB by driving it from their end. Um, I mentioned uh, about uh, hybrid functionals. Um, so if you actually um, include long range corrections and, and, and the Niehaus group have done a lot of work in this area, uh, you can substantially improve things like absorption spectra for cases where there are long range charge transfers in the system. Going beyond that, particle particle RPA so this is a, a originally idea from Waito Yang's group, uh, but um, uh, Adriel um, Garcia has, has implemented this in, in DFTB. Um, that allows you to get access to things like two particle excitations, which conventional time dependent DFT kind of methods can't deal with. I mentioned about real time propagation. Um, the, the group that contributed the, the work here from, from Argentina um, have recently also got a method paper out, there, uh, out from this. So, for example, we can do things like take a molecule and hit it with a simulated laser pulse and have a look at how both the electronic and nuclear degrees of freedom in the system evolve. And you can use that, for example, to calculate spectra. So this is an absorption spectrum from a graphene nano ribbon where the thing is periodic along the vertical direction of the screen and is hydrogen terminated laterally. And so you can, you can have a look at things like onset edges 
and optical absorption, but you can also look at the dynamics of the electrons within these kinds of systems under perturbation. I mentioned about transport, um, talking about semi-infinite systems, of course, um, you can have transport through a finite region where you wire the thing up to semi-infinite contacts on the edges. And for example, you can look at transmission probabilities um, traveling through the, the system, and you can resolve things by how the electrons are actually getting across the device. Um, going further than just transmission probabilities, you can also, of course, bias the system and have different Fermi levels on different ends of the, the structure or multiple contacts in there and simulate nanoscale devices for this. And um, the uh, um, Calo and Pechia groups um, do a lot of work in this area. And that technology, again, has been in, in the code base and available under the LGPL main license for the last year or so. And we're starting to get ready for things like hybrid functionals, but also things like electron phonon coupling in that, that context. Okay, right. Um, we have another release, which is mostly composed of things that didn't quite make it into the 20.1, but are mentioned in the, the paper from earlier this year. Um, and so, for example, ah, right, perils of recycling a slide I've just seen see Tim's talk yesterday. Um, there are methods to get excited state in a time independent way. So for things like Delta SCF. Um, so this is, for example, the work of the Kowalski group um, in uh, Western Washington University. Um, and it gives you a, a different handle on getting excited state, but it is about the same kinds of costs as a ground state calculation. We've also got further improvement in terms of the solvers that we've got. Um, so linear scaling um, graph theory based technology from Los Alamos. And um, we're also going to be picking up some improvements on things like the um, unusual boundary conditions for uh, transport and also for unusual geometries. The phonon transport version of the code is about ready to go. So that will be hopefully there in October. Um, and we're also starting to generalize out and offer Hamiltonians that aren't just the classical DFTB type Hamiltonian. So for example, Stefan Grimmer's group, their self-consistent um, semi-empirical form of type binding, um, they contributed some code towards this and at least one of their models is gonna be present. And the exciting thing there is um, because of the difference in the way the Hamiltonian is parameterized, they've effectively got most of the periodic table already pre-parameterized in a single model. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how this works with some of the other extensions that we've got. Okay, so where I'm gonna kind of leave things is just to um, stick up a couple of URLs. So if you're interested in these kinds of semi-empirical methods, the portal for the entire community is the FTB org. And that's got links to where you can find resources from other codes and some of the, the major review papers in the area. But the particular implementation I work with, if you're on GitHub, have a look at, uh, at this, but um, the ftbplus.org is out there. And I think that's where I'm going to stop. Okay, are there questions? Yeah, so thank you very much for your talk today, uh, Dr. Huerin. Uh, so yeah, apologies we... about the um, connection problems. Oh yeah, absolutely no problem. Yeah, it can happen to everyone, of course. Uh, so just wondering now we have some time for question and answer. Um, uh, so please remember to unmute yourself before you would like to ask your question. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions, this is the right time to ask them. So please go ahead. Mm, yeah. Hello? Yeah. Hello. We can hear you. Yeah. Hi. Um, yeah. So, hi. Um, nice uh, talk, uh, Dr. Julian. Thanks. Am I pronouncing your name right? I'm really so sorry. <laughs> Don't worry. Sure. Everybody has problems with it. It's, it's okay. Sure. Yeah. So, sure. Yeah. Um, so it was a good talk. Um, so I'm more in just, I've actually used the DFT based quantum mechanical molecular modeling before. Mm -hmm. So in my system, there was not too many atoms. So is there any significant advantage to actually change to DFTB with, with respect, whereas with DFT? So in the previous in my systems, I only modeled like about uh, 18 or 20 atoms who have actually used quantum mechanically. Sure. Okay. Well, I suppose the question is do you just simulate one? Um, molecule or one system, or do you do this multiple times? 
uh, multiple times. So I do take uh, different sample sets. So mm -hmm. because molecular modeling does require uh, larger sample sets to be actually to be verified. At least in my system, we talk more about diff uh, diffusivity. So we do run them at different temperatures as well. So yeah. Okay. Well, the the, the difference there for small systems is. Um, a lot of the um, constant cost prefactors in DFT mean that um, you're going to be presumably waiting ten, maybe 10 seconds or something like that for your solution. Yes. Yeah, something yeah. Like that. If you do the same thing with DFTB, it will be completed in maybe 10 milliseconds. Okay. So if you have a lot of these things, then, then there is maybe a case for doing this. Um, but if, oh. if your computing budget is not being stretched by what you're doing, um, Mm -hmm. then un unless we can calculate a particular property that you, you want access to, um, DFT is, is going to be a um, more accurate way of getting what you want. Okay. Uh, so another question, uh, so it's more related to do with my understanding of this topic because I haven't really used DFTB before. So do you, when you actually test for the accuracy of a system, do you actually take uh, like or if you're running a system on um, say from scratch, mm -hmm. uh, do you actually take your geometry and optimize it using DFT or do you actually do the geometry optimization as well from DFTB as well, from um, well, using DFT? People have done both. So it's quite often the case that at least when people are initially testing whether a parameterization is working, they will co-optimize with both methods and just see if the, the resulting geometry is, is deviating strongly. Um, but you can do full optimization as long as you're in a regime where you think the parameter set is working properly. Okay. Um, but yeah, yeah there, there are uh, a, a, a bunch of the, the, the papers that do things like thermochemical testing for, for libraries and molecules. One of the things they will report is RMS deviations in the geometrically optimized structures. Uh, and quite often what people find themselves doing is they use the DFTB um, machinery is a quick pre-optimizer and then they take the geometry mm -hmm. and put it into DFT afterwards. Um, there, there's a, okay. a, a similar kind of thing going on the other way with classical force fields where you do something that looks a bit like predictor corrector type methods where you do the dynamics most of the time with a, with a very cheap force field and then every so often turn on the quantum mechanics and, and see what, what's going wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thank you. No problem. Hello, Hello Mr. Mishra, would you like to ask yes, a question? Uh, yeah. Uh, thanks, it was a nice talk. Uh, I have a doubt like, uh, means in this basis, you explain this atomic densities you are. Uh, calculated by com confining in a small region. Mm -hmm. Means is that true? Means how it reduces the computational time? I, I didn't follow that step. Right. Um, it is um, as a result of doing that that you then construct the, uh, uh, the Hamiltonian for the global system. So in in DFT, you typically start from from atomic orbitals, um, which are well, it depends on the code, if you're using an atom-centered basis, uh, which are normally optimized to, to minimize the, the total energy in some way. Now, depending on how that's done, some of the forms of basis sets which are uh, uh, developed in, in uh, groups like, for example, Siesta, um, you actually use a confined set of orbitals. And I think the FPLO code as well from Dresden does something similar. So in these cases, the idea would be to just do the compression to improve the description of the, the local state by making the orbitals on the atoms a bit like the, the contribution that they're going to give in a condensed environment. Now, doing that is, is in DFT done for um, improvement of accuracy reasons. With DFTB, the idea would be instead of um, then proceeding to set up the full cone charm equations in that basis, which is, is going to be expensive, what you do is parameterize a model, um, well, in fact, it's not parameterized, it's stored, uh, which is expanded out in those local um, atomic orbitals. Now, the way that the DFTB is doing this um, is um, that instead of having the full Kern-Sharm equations, you cut things down to an expansion 
in terms of um, the um, first few terms in, in an, an expansion and fluctuation, but you also um, break things down into the slater costa type idea of representing pairwise integrals um, for the system. And the, the, the net consequence for that is, and, and this kind of thing is done a lot in, in various sorts of empirical quantum chemistry. So this is methods um, that take the Hartree-Fock theories and approximate them as well. What you have is a controlled neglect of some of the integrals that go into the full uh, expressions. Um, now the, the main time savings for those uh, consequences are that to set those equations up, if you want to do them full for the full equations with the DFT, you have to do things like numerical quadrature uh, or rather the cubature over uh, grids in, in, in space to calculate various terms. Um, and um, if you can break things down in this way instead, everything becomes effectively an interpolation process, which is a much, much cheaper uh, thing to do. Um, so you drop um, some of the, the, the numerically heavy lifting for the, the, the calculation. The other reason that this is, is also speeding up is back to the fact that these capture the, uh, the quantum mechanics reasonably well. Um, so you can work with a minimal basis instead of um, the, the large basis sets you would normally need to get converged results in DFT. Now, the reason we can get away with that in turn is that the pairwise repulsive terms that we've got um, partly um, adapt for errors in the total energy from approximations in the quantum mechanical part of this. Um, but as I say, in principle, that can be done to very high accuracy. Um, but the, the upshot of this is going back to what I was saying about scaling. Um, in a minimal basis, um, obviously each atom, well, if it's, if it's main block chemistry, you have four orbitals per atom. So there's an S function two, uh, and three P functions. Um, if you go to a slightly less minimal basis, so something like um, 631 um, as, a, as a fairly small basis set for, for uh, quantum chemistry, um, you have um, not just the, the four functions you started out with, but you have uh, effectively 12 functions per atom. And the electronic solution of these things requires linear algebra, which scales as the cube of that number. So you can, you can obviously see having a factor of three here means you're going to have um, approximately 27 times the computational cost by having that larger basis. And 631 is not a particularly large Gaussian basis. Um, but if you're just interested in the total energies, we can live with the minimal basis, which is just four functions. And we, we get away with it. Uh, one more thing, like uh, for uh, this repulsive interaction, you have to do empirically. Um, okay, there, there are a number of different attempts in the literature ranging between empirical um, to fully first principles. Um, so the, the classical method that, that, that most people follow when they're building new parameters for this is they take a library of um, related uh, so chemical compounds, if, if the intention is a molecular system, which are similar to the, the, the environments that you're going to be simulating when you actually want to do the real system. Um, and then what they'll do is investigate a bunch of different bond distortions, torsional motions, bending motions, and so on, and fit uh, a, a discrepancy between the DFTB electronics and the DFT total energies. And that gives you this, this pairwise repulsive. Um, people have also, and I, I mentioned Thomas Heiner's group, um, have looked at directly calculating um, the pairwise uh, terms from density functional theory and just storing those. And he, he, his group had a paper about three years ago where they, um, they gave a draft parameterization for the repulsive for the entire periodic table using that technology. Um, admittedly, in that particular paper, they only looked at homonuclear uh, solids and molecules. They didn't look at cases where you have mixtures of atoms. So it's kind of an open question as to how well uh, that particular approach works. Now, these days, uh, what a number of groups are, are instead doing is trying to get uh, various forms of machine learning or machine optimization to do this work for them. Um, so there's a, about um, six papers in the last 
two or three years using variations on deep neural networks, uh, for example, to do this problem. Um, but there's also other attempts where people, for example, take um, molecular dynamics trajectories and use that to explore areas of the potential surface, which is you know, important for, say, chemical reactions, or that will become occupied at higher temperatures. And then they'll do something like a Gaussian process inversion, or um, there's also some Boltzmann machine work that was done at EPFL in Switzerland um, to try and fit these things. So that there's many, many different ways that, that people have tried with this. Um, as of the moment, there's, there is not a single best solution black box you press a button on, but several groups are quite close to the situation. Of course, in, in a lot of applications, you're reliant on parameter sets, which have already been seriously tested over multiple years in many applications. So if, if you're lucky enough that your system falls into that, um, that regime, then, then all of that work is already done. Thank you. All right, uh, I can see that a lot of people have already left the meeting. Um, so I suppose there are no more questions for Mr. Huranin. Um, okay, well, thank, thank you, Gabriella, for the opportunity to, uh, to speak. And, right. uh, uh, thank you very much for your time. So I propose to put an end to this meeting. And uh, thank you very much for your time today. <laughs> very interesting talk here. <laughs> bye, bye. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.